28th, this is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Sandwich uh, Board of Appeals. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The Board of Appeals currently has five regular members and two alternate members. The Board of Appeals can have up to four alternate members. Any decision of this board requires a two-thirds vote. Two-thirds of five is four. If only four members vote, the vote would have to be unanimous. If five members vote, one member could dissent. Uh, the board asks that if anyone is recording this meeting, please notify me. No recordings. Okay, so noted. All right, old business first on the agenda is uh, special permit number 19-04, 0 Pocasset Road and 0 Sham Road, map 37, parcels 1 and 2, the Adventure Park at Heritage Museums and Gardens, LLC, special permit continued for the purposes of operating a ropes course as a small-scale outdoor recreational facility pursuant to section 4150 of the zoning bylaw. Um, Last meeting, if any of you were here or you, you read, uh, it was quite lengthy and we had a lot of people on both sides offer their opinions and uh, we're going to have the applicant speak but uh, to any new uh, information that's come before us. But uh, we ask that if anybody wants to speak, you're more than welcome to, but if it's something you've already said or something somebody else has already said, uh, let's try and keep it to new information and let's try and keep it under five minutes apiece. Um, so, uh, and then we did just... Do you want to mention that uh, Eric won't be here tonight, but he'll listen? Yeah, Eric Van Buzzkirk is a regular board member. He, he's not able to make it tonight. Jerry Nye is sitting in for him, and he has listened to the uh, tape from the last session and uh, signed the affidavit that uh, is required. Um, the, uh, we did, since the last meeting, we have received some, uh, some letters of opposition and some letters of, uh, you know, of in, in favor of, and we've also received some additional letters from uh, Attorney Mello and from uh, Attorney Cox from the Heritage, and we've all had time to review and uh, take a look at that, and that'll generate some more questions. So uh, let us begin. Thank you. Yes, I just said that. No, I knew I understood you received materials. I wasn't sure if you got the cover email. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the record, my name is Liza Cox. I'm an attorney with Nutter, McLennan and Fish here in Hyannis on behalf of the applicant. Uh, joining me this evening to my right is Ann Scott Putney, the President and CEO of Heritage Museums and Gardens. And to her right, Bauman Azarm, who's the CEO of Outdoor Ventures. In addition, uh, on our team, Pat Dunford from VHB, our traffic engineer, who you heard from last time, is present tonight. Brian Lavieri from Horsley Witten Group is present here tonight. And Heather Ross of Cape Cod and Islands Appraisal Group uh, from Barnstable is here tonight. Um, she was the one who prepared the market impact uh, assessment uh, that we submitted with the application materials and is prepared tonight to respond to Mr. Killian's a uh, question regarding the data sets, and I'll have her speak in just a moment. Um, first, I wanted to follow up with the board on a few items since the initial uh, public hearing on May 14th. Um, as the chair referenced, we submitted a letter dated May 24th that had, I would say, primarily three components. The first component was uh, in the letter clarifying that this use is not an amusement park within the meaning of your zoning bylaw or within the meaning of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts regulations. Um, to me, it is very clear that by any stretch of imagination, this is not an amusement park within the meaning of either of those documents. And so between the testimony that we provided previously, as well as, as elaborated upon in my memorandum, we have outlined that this is not an amusement park. Um, I'm not intending to go into that in any detail uh, again tonight. Um, because I think we've covered it now between the hearing and the memo, but obviously if the board has any questions or concerns, we would like an opportunity to respond uh, to that question. 
The second component of the May 24th memorandum reiterates our position that the tree, floor, tree platforms are not structures within the meaning of the zoning bylaw, and I do want to spend a moment here. So at the site visit, the board members had the opportunity to view the platforms that are in the trees. And as you saw, each platform sits on wedges surrounding, which are surrounding the tree. The platforms are, sit, are there by compression. There is nothing attached to the trees. There are no bolts going into the trees. There are no nails going into the trees. There are no screws going into the trees. Rather, the method of suspending the platforms is in contrast, we suggest, to the definition of structure within your zoning bylaw, which expressly requires attachment to something on the ground or a fixed location on the ground. Here, the elements, the platforms, are not attached to the ground or on anything to the ground, and therefore, they cannot be structures within the meaning of your zoning, excuse me, zoning bylaw. Moreover, previously the town also did not consider them to be structures when this project received a building permit back in 20, uh, 2015, 2014, 2015. Um, I have given some thought as to what I think is intended by the language within your zoning bylaw that talks about a, a structure being any form, anything constructed or erected, the use of which requires attachment to something on the ground. I believe that language is intended to regulate things like second floor decks, which are attached to buildings that are located on the ground, or porticos, or roof overhangs, or awnings, all things that are attached to something that's constructed on the ground. Here the platforms are sitting in the trees by compression. They're not even attached to the trees. They're sitting on wedges that lean against the trees. Now I did see um, the memo that, or the email rather, that Attorney Mello submitted that included a draft letter that we had prepared back from 2014 that got publicly released. And it did indicate at the time that our view was that the structures, these platforms, could be structures within the meaning of the bylaw. I will say ultimately the building commissioner disagreed and issued a building permit confirming and indicating that they are not structures within the meaning of, of the zoning bylaw. And that memo, frankly, was intended to address whether or not they were buildings within the meaning of the bylaw requiring um, compliance with the general setback requirements. So ultimately, I, I stand here today um, believing strongly that within the meaning of your bylaw, the tree platforms are not structures, and that is our position. And frankly, the town agreed with us last time when this project went through the building permit process. Finally, the last thing that was included in the letter that was submitted uh, by our office on May 24th was a color graphic that was requested by the board, which shows the location of the ropes courses uh, on the property. And each ropes course is shown as a different color in that graphic. Um, in addition, in the middle of last week, Mr. Vitacchio contacted me requesting, and I, may, I think it may have come from a board member, that we submit historic uh, daily attendance data for both Heritage Museum and Gardens and the Adventure Park. And I'm going to submit that. It took some time for us to pull this together. Um, so I will submit that tonight to the board. Are you going to give us a summary of? Yes, I will give you a summary. Um, as you'll recall, first of all, we did provide the board with our application the annual attendance numbers at the Adventure Park. So this is a breakdown of daily attendance numbers over a period of two years. And you'll see there are two documents that are attached to the packet that's being handed out. At the top, the documents indicate 2017 daily attendance data and 2018 daily attendance data. So this is two years worth of attendance data. And there are three columns. So the first column on the left in yellow shows, shows the date. The second column, which is in pink, or peach, are the attendance data from Heritage Museums and Gardens. And the third column, which is shown in blue, are the attendance numbers at the Adventure Park. Some observations about the, this information. First, I want to make clear that these numbers do not reflect the number of vehicles or cars that are coming to either facility. Rather, they are the number of individual climbers or attendees, climbers at the Adventure Park, attendees at the Museum and Gardens. Secondly, 
I want to make clear that these attendance numbers are spread out over the course of a day, and they're not numbers that happen all at once at either location. How many hours is that? It depends on the day. Okay. So um, in the summer, and Bauman, correct me, you're generally the park's open 8, 8 a.m.? 8 till um, generally 8 o'clock, till it gets dark. So roughly a 12-hour day. Correct. Right. And, and for heritage, uh, Anna, just correct me, the hours are less. So it's shorter out, 10 to 5, shorter hours. And as you'll see when you look through the numbers, more attendees. At the Adventure Park, the number of climbers is regulated so by a couple of factors. First, the number of harnesses that are available. And we had previously testified there are 120 harnesses that are available. So that's the maximum number of climbers. In addition, there's a, a reservation system that the Adventure Park has to limit the number of climbers that can happen at any one time. And they take the reservation system very carefully and with a lot of consideration. They want the experience not to be one where you're crowded or rush feeling like you're rushing in the trees, but that you have a moment and you're out in the elements without being crowded by other climbers. <coughs> so this is very important. And they have over the years adjusted the number of people that they have starting at any one given time to make sure that there is adequate pacing between the climbers. Another observation, <clears throat> the Adventure Park, in response to a question that I asked, has informed me that typically reservations are made in groups of four people. Again, so when you look at these numbers, these are reservations that are typically coming in four at a time. Finally, the overall uh, observation, when looking at Heritage Museum and Gardens versus the Adventure Park, you can see that Heritage Museums and Gardens is a significantly higher generator of attendees than the Adventure Park. And I ha we're happy to try and answer any questions if you have any on, on those, those numbers. Finally, before I introduce Heather Ross, I wanted to wrap up on a couple of things. First, we believe that we have demonstrated, and it is clear, that the Adventure Park is a recreational use. It is similar to a climbing wall, which is included as an example in your zoning bylaw of a recreation facility. And in fact, the Superior Court, uh, when it previously determined that this was not dominantly an educational use, found this to be dominantly a recreational use. We believe we have demonstrated, and it is clear, that this is a small-scale use. Most of the criteria contained in Section 4151 of your zoning bylaw is there to ensure that outdoor recreation uses are small in scale. These include limits on the amount of square footage for any structures, limits on the number of stories for any structures, requirements of a larger lot, which again goes right to scale, limits on the amount of impervious surfaces, and limits on spectator seats, the number of spectator seats. This project meets each of those requirements. We have demonstrated with the materials we've submitted and the testimony provided that this project does not result in any substantial harm or derogation. We've provided a traffic study showing minimal impacts. We've provided an economic analysis showing no impact and rising property values in the surrounding area. We've provided a noise study showing no impacts from the adjoining residential property, which is the Highview condominiums. And this project has no, virtually no uh, impact to the environment itself. There's very little clearing, and the health of the trees and the environment is critical to the experience. Finally, I wanted to respond to the comments that this is not the right place that we heard, or that this is inconsistent with the neighborhood. We respectfully disagree with those comments and offer that this outdoor recreation use is wholly consistent with the surrounding land uses, which include Heritage Museum and Gardens. You heard testimony from a board member talking how this is very consistent with Heritage's mission. Shalm Road, Shalm Kroll State Forest, which is hiking, biking, and camping, all outdoor uses, like as is proposed, and the 100-acre school. The closest residential use to this facility is a quarter of a mile away, and it is substantially buffered by mature vegetation. Uh, from the Adventure Park. We therefore believe it meets the criteria for the granting of the special permit. And what I'd like to do now is invite uh, Heather Ross to come up uh, and respond to Mr. Killian's question and any other questions that the board may have about the impact analysis she prepared. 
Can we just speak for a moment about this yeah. submission? Sure. We move on? Um, this is actually very helpful because I think some of the things we're discussing. The, um, the hours in the winter time when you have a you know a very uh, large group of people. What are the hours of operation for that period of time? For, are you talking for a heritage or for the adventure? Well, I mean, the adventure park is closed in, in the winter, but right. you have large numbers on right. the weekend. I mean, the, these numbers here, obviously, over a long, long period of time, right. whole day. The, the ones in the winter time is that sort of a small period of time? I know a lot of this is, is nighttime activity. So. The gardens are yeah. yeah, so it's it's probably like a three hour window or somewhere thereabouts, How or or I'm longer. It has it. Four, hours. Four, hours. Four, four hours. Four hours. Four hours. So is that, are you looking like on 1124, 1125? Yeah, all the ones yeah. in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Gardens Glow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, I have a question similar to what Jim just asked. Um, I think the max that the Adventure Park had was 370 on July 6th. Yep. Okay. Uh, granted, it wouldn't be equally 370, but that would be about 30 people per hour. Have you ever attained the 120 max that your course could hold at any time? Um, yes, actually, there's, uh, we do have 120 harnesses, but in general, there's no more than 110 that are actually the within course. the area. Well, even less than that, because there are always people getting harnessed and always people coming down. There are a lot of people that um, uh, are taking their harnesses off, so there's really not... 110 people ever in the trees at the same time. Okay. Could I further respond to that too? I had spoken with the park operator regarding that particular number, the 370. She had told me that that day, that is the largest number that they had, um, and that the course was too crowded. And so following that day, they actually made changes to the reservation system to reduce the number so that there wouldn't be so many people starting at any one given time, mm -hmm. so that there wouldn't be 370 for the max. So there, again, I, I know that 370 was over. It's the over a period of time, but that was that was the day that was yeah. a little crowded, and okay. so they adjusted the reservation system following that event. And what's the average per day? Um, it really differs on um, the season, and no, but no, in, in July, the entire uh, season. Um, well, a, a um, good Saturday, nice sunny Saturday in July or August, we might get 250 now. But that's that's a weekend. During the week, it's going to be. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yeah, somewhere uh, between 100 and 200 max. So 150 would and, be a good number. And you mentioned that four people is the average reservation size. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Heather Ross, and I'm a real estate appraiser. I've worked in this market for over 30 years, and know Sandwich and the Cape very well. My question last week, uh, two weeks ago, was relative to the, um, the time that you took the samples. In other words, some of them were three years, some of them were six years. Yes. Back. And actually, if you could sort of answer that question in the scope of the how you put the entire assessment together that would be very helpful okay should we just go section by section certainly okay so in the impact analysis the focus or of the assignment was to identify whether or not there had been any diminution in market value due to the ropes course at the Heritage Museum. Now, the first set of data I looked at was the con two condominium projects. Those were relevant because they're proximate the museum 
and I was able to find sufficient data from 2014, which is prior to the installation of the ropes course, to the end of 2018. So that was a five-year period to see what were the sales and resales in those two specific condominium developments. Now, one of the significant features about that is that these units existed or were built after the museum was established, and they are also proximate the highway, which generates, a, I would say, a measurable um, noise, a measurable negative noise influence for that location. Okay, so in the sale price of each of those units is implicit those two factors. So they already knew about the traffic to the museum, and they already had this noise factor from the highway. So then I set the time frame from 2014, prior to the installation of the ropes course, to the end of 2018, which would track a price per square foot for units in both those developments to see was, was there any increase, was it stable, or was there a measurable decline. So that was the, the time frame set the criteria for the data research. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So in the first two studies, each condominium development was looked at separately to see did the decline or increase or stabilization of values in both those projects, were they consistent? And that, the data showed that they were consistent. And in fact, the, the values increased on a per square foot basis. And it demonstrated that there were no decline in values. Then with the same data from 2014 to 2018, I discovered sales and resales of units in both those projects. And a sale and a resale of the same unit is very significant because you have identical features in that specific unit, whether it has a view, whether it's close to the highway, not close to the highway, does it have a garage? So there's a higher level of uniformity. So in comparing the sales and resales, I was restricted to specific units that had sold prior to the installation of the ropes course to post-installation. So let me see. I think that's on page 9. So, so you, here we have a... Just to stop, when you say resale, you're talking about a unit that was transactions were, were multiple within that time period? The same unit? The same unit. So if you look at page 9 of the impact study, I found four sales and resales. And the significant thing about this study is that there's a lot of features that were identical. Now, if the unit had been upgraded or there had been physical features regarding each of these four units that had changed, I reviewed the assessor's property record card to see if a building permit had been taken out and I reviewed the MLS listings to actually see the interior photographs of each of these units where they were available. So I was able to identify were there any changes between the first sale and the second sale. So like for number one, we've got Highview Drive and that sold in 2014 and it sold again in 2018. And we saw for instance with this sale, the annual increase was 5% based on an overall increase of 20%. So that's how I took this. This was our third data set, and that's how I took this and dug into the data to see what was the, what was the activity between sales and resales. So that's why some of these sales were like, well, let's see. One of them is in 2012, right? And the second, the resale was in 2015. And that 2015 date was after the ropes course had been installed. So from this viewpoint, it was a way of trying to see, was there any market reaction to the installation of that ropes course based on sales and then resales? OK? So that's that data set. And then at the end of, um, at the bottom of that page, there's a summary of 
the results of the analysis of the high view condos, the hilltop condos, and the sales and resales. And you can see there were measurable increases in value, which demonstrated, in fact, there was, there was no decline. Okay? So how did, let's. How did that compare with, with other areas? With other areas. Properties that are is a good question. So I have another piece of data here from the Banker and Tradesman, also known as the Warren Group, and that is the data compilation company out of Boston that compiles sales and resales of properties throughout Barnstable counties and in each town. So for instance, and I'm going to bring this up to you, okay, because this wasn't included in this Condos in Sandwich. Now, this is general data, right? This is all the sales. So it's not as specific as the impact study, but this gives you a general idea of what was happening in the market as a whole for residential condos in Sandwich. And it shows there was an overall increase over this four year period of 35%, but also a, an 8.4% increase annually. So even though that number may not be specific, to the condominium mm -hmm. projects that have bought the museum, it's still demonstrating that the increase in values in those condominium projects is consistent with increases in the market as a whole. Okay? okay. So that's where this general data links in with what we found in those specific projects. Okay? Can you, Does that make sense? Sure. Can you give that to the clerk first? Thank you. Can you go, uh, so that was one, that was High View? Yes. Yes, it was, it was both the condominium projects okay. um, showed an increase in value. Yeah, one was at uh, 6.25, the other 5.75. Correct, yeah, uh, and it was average, it was average oh, sure. over that, because that kind of gives us, that's telling us a story. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about on the single family dwellings? Okay, so let's look at, um, great question, and, and so I looked at the, um, Sales on Pine Street. Um, I looked at what had sold and resold on Pine Street. Now, there were fewer sales, so I was limited to the data that was available. And the earliest sale I had was in 2015. So this analysis is different from these first two analyses that were done on the condominium projects because I didn't have any sales that were significantly prior to the installation of the ropes course. However, if that ropes course had a measurable diminution on property values, we would see it between 2015 and 2018. And since Pine Street is one of, it's the main access road into the museum, from my analysis standpoint, I believe that there would be a measurable decrease in property values on Pine Street if, in fact, the increase in tra traffic resulted in a diminution to privacy. Was there an increase in noise, right? And we know as residents on Cape Cod, we have the summer influx of tourists. So we have a certain impact in terms of the increase in traffic almost everywhere. But in terms of Pine Street, in 2015, the average price per square foot was about $240 a square foot. In 2016, it was about 260 and then in no sales in 2017. And then in 2018, it was about 263 Now, the increase per year was about 2.25%. So we see not as, not as measurable as in the condominium projects. However, the significant thing about this study is that it didn't show a decline. Now, 2014 and 2015 was the bottom of the recession. We still had an oversupply of inventory on the market, and it began to be absorbed. So, what would we assume? We would assume that the values would remain probably fairly stable. But in this case, we saw, yes, there was a little bit of an uptick. 
So in my mind, my conclusion was the increased traffic did not have a measurable diminution on value. There was not a huge number of sales of people leaving that street, and we would have seen a decrease in the price per square foot. So this, the time frame, coming back to your comment on this, the time frame on this was limited by the relevant and consistent data that was available in terms of the actual sales that had happened on Pine Street. What about in terms, with, with speak to the sales, the, the days on market, did you look at that to see if that got longer during this period of time? No, the issue of the days on market, now that's relevant because in 2013, 2014, and 2015, there was an oversupply of inventory on the market in most market segments. It did result in longer marketing times, and it did result in some cases in people having to discount their properties to shorten up that sale, sale period. However, in analyzing this data, the longer marketing time is implicit in the sale price. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So that's why this unit of comparison had a higher level of reliability because a lot of these smaller features were actually incorporated in the sale price, which resulted in the price per square foot. And then you mentioned the, um, the inventory level. And I think they measure that in, in days of inventory or something like that. Usually that's measured in what you mentioned earlier, the days on market. Yeah. So how has that changed from what well, you said it sort of flattened out in 15 to, yeah. say, 18? 15, to, well, what we've seen from 2015 to 2018 is the inventory was gradually absorbed, and we started to see asking prices increase and sale prices increase. So on that sheet um, that the yep. assistant now has, you'll see that the average sale price began to increase because it's this is the normal dynamic of the market. When there's an oversupply, and we all know this from owning real estate and having homes here, as the inventory increases and there's more competition, we have to uh, price a property more competitively in order to sell it within a certain time frame. So those features are actually included in these, this price per square foot analysis. And then lastly, the, um, you did an analysis based on location to recreational uses? Oh, yes. Yeah, that was the, um, that was the final analysis. Um, and the purpose of this part of the study was to see whether there was uh, any negative influence in the market to outdoor recreational facilities. And for instance, so the basis of this study was to take um, a sale of a property that was next door to a school that had an outdoor field or uh, I think I have one that's uh, next to a town um, baseball field, an outdoor use. So it compared a property in similar kind of neighborhood without the recreational use and a sale with the recreational use. And adjustments were made to the sale that was not proximate the recreational use to take out any amenities that were superior or inferior. And the resulting adjusted value correlated with the sale price of the property that was located next to the recreational use. So in this study, it sort of it expanded out the whole impact study and brought it out into the bigger market and said, okay, well, what about how do buyers react to being next to a school with a ball field? And actually, one of these sales, which I thought was quite good. I'm going to cite the page. It was uh, 17. It was on um, Cranberry Circle. And that's next to the Barnstable High School campus. And there they have a middle school 
a high school, and that is a very intensively used outdoor, outdoor recreational amenities. They have numerous tennis courts, three to four ball fields, a football field, and so the sale that was used in this comparison was at 122 Cranberry Circle, which was next to the high school recreational amenities, and then that was compared to a house that was sold inside that neighborhood that was not next to the school. And the result was that there was really no, no measurable difference between the two locations. Is that your general observation? I mean, you've obviously been doing real estate for a while. And do you find that um, property located near these type of uses suffers any type of value diminution? Well, that is a general comment. It is. And in my experience, general comments can be very misleading, especially on Cape Cod, because our neighborhoods are very segmented. And for instance, in this particular case, these types of properties are in a market segment where a family might want to be right next to the school. And, and so the buyer motivation may be different. Some folks are fine with, for instance, buying a condo in one of those uh, high view next to the highway. They may not care about the traffic noise. Another buyer may not buy in that condo project because they don't want to be next to the highway. So that's where we really have to drill down into the information and really see what is, what, what's happening with buyers and how, do the, how are they making their purchase decision and where do they place the value. So to answer my original question about the time of the study, it was yes. based on the available data that you had? Yes, it was, it was a bit based on available data, but also the primary purpose of the impact study was to identify the difference between what was happening in the market before the installation of the ropes course and what was happening after. And based on that purview, I went into the market and found the relevant sales as they were available. Okay, okay thank you very much. That's my question. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Any other questions from uh, board members to the uh, applicant? My opinion is that the definition that's given to us in the protective zoning bylaws defines what that these are indeed structures, these platforms and the trees. And of course these components consist of a lot of different products. It's, it's wood, it's cables. Um, so in your opinion then, a, a tree with a piece of cable around it going to another tree would be considered a, a structure. Is that, is that correct? Um, the cable in and of itself I would not see as a structure, but in this case I believe there are tunnels and lakes where people crawl through them to get from one tree to another. I would consider that to be a structure. Okay, so if we had a, a as I said, a tree that just had a cable to support something else, you would not consider that a structure? Um, that by itself wouldn't, and a good example would be a clothesline. If you just had a clothesline, that obviously would not be considered a structure, but in this case you have a combination of, uh, of bridges, of platforms, and cables that contribute to these platforms and uh, bridges, so I, I believe they would be a structure. So a cable between two trees with devices suspended from it would not be a structure or would be? In the case of supporting the bridges that cross from one tree to another, I would see them as a structure. What about elements that don't have, isn't a bridge? Like I've seen elements, they just have ropes hanging from the cables between a tree. 
would that be considered a structure in your definition? Um, probably not in accordance with the, what's here in the bottle. Okay, so it's specifically anything that's part or, or affixed near the tree or to the tree. Yeah, I think it's, I think basically what it says is that uh, anything constructed or erected, the use of which requires fixed location on the ground or attachment to something on the ground. In this case, the structure is attached to the platform. The structure of the platform is attached to the tree. And that includes all buildings, mobile homes, etc., things that aren't pertinent here. And there are exclusions, and the exclusions are not including pavement, usual lawn accessories, fences or retaining walls six feet in height or less. They're not uh, to be considered in this case. We don't have those here. So do you have any comment in terms of uh, previous conclusions that the building department may have drawn that these were not structures? Um, sure. Bear with me if you look. As far as the building department determine, determining that they were not structures, I would quote from my predecessor, Paul Spiro, who was intimately involved with this uh, project from the word go. And Paul wrote, with the aforementioned in mind, it would be my interpretation that the tree platforms, although only 12 inches in height, are structures. In fact, they agreed to that interpretation. Um, that's what the, the building department's previous position, as I understand. And how did that um, work with setbacks, including the, seat, the, the street and the, uh, the side setback? You didn't take any of that into consideration? Um, the, the setbacks, the front setbacks, would probably have been 30 feet, I believe, at the time. I believe some of these structures are less than that at this point, and I, I can't comment for how and my predecessor interpreted that. Because there there's a side line, there's a property line in the, be, between the lots, correct? I beg your pardon. There's a property line between the lots that almost bisects the park? Yeah, I believe there was also an amendment that took place in the zoning bylaws. Uh, I think it was in May of 2014. Um, originally, there was, a, there was a provision for any, uh, or any items that were less than 30 inches in height were excluded. Um, that was removed uh, after the, the permit was issued, I think, in around 2015, thereabouts. But in terms of that other lot line, um, how would, would you treat that as a line that would need a setback? As it stands now? Right. Yes. You talked the line in between the, yes. between their two lots. Mm -hmm. Oh, between the, no, no. Lots, so no. You would not? N not between the two lots if okay. they're owned by the same entity. Okay, even based on what the bylaw says in terms of the boundary, property boundary. Um, well, those lots are obviously put to have come together. If they're going to use the uh, the course to overlap from one lot to another, then I would see it as, as one lot at that point. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, could I respond to one thing? Yes, please. Thank you. So I have um, the trial testimony from the Superior Court case when Mr. Spiro testified, and I'd just like to read a portion of it. So um, Mr. Spiro was asked, and did you reach a conclusion as to what the best manner to proceed with respect to this specific question of the structures and them being potentially in the setback? And he, Mr. Spiro responded, I believe I did. And then the question was asked, and what did you conclude was the best way to proceed? And Mr. Spiro testified, the best way to proceed was to, you know, consider them, you know, not structures and being part of the elements of the project at hand. And this was during the trial testimony of the Superior Court case. So ultimately, my understanding is Mr. Spiro concluded them not to be structures as he testified to during the Superior Court trial. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for town council or for uh, Brendan or for the applicant? No. All right. Uh, would anyone from the public like to speak to this continuing discussion? And please, let's try and be brief. Hi, I'm Jennifer Bouchard, if you recall from the last uh, series for 24 Pine Street. I just wanted to speak a little bit specifically to the assessment, the impact analysis, and I, I did submit a letter. Yeah, excuse me. Please, when you do come up to speak, just sign so we can keep track of who's speaking and 
go from there. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of the points from my letter that I don't think that the um, that Ms. Ross addressed. The, the limitation of the data set, I was surprised by the fact that the answer was that the data was not available prior to 2014 or 2015 with respect to Pine Street. Uh, I think that's pretty unusual to do a, an evaluation of a trend in data to not at least establish a significant baseline and a trend and then evaluate um, the difference that occurs after the baseline or after the change. Um, I'm definitely uh, concerned about the fact that the conclusion was that there would have been an immediate change in market value after the increase in traffic. I think, at least in my experience in real estate, which is relatively limited, but it would take some time for that change to be a, a, to affect the market, particularly on a street like Pine Street, where there's you know at least 50% of these properties were purchased by out-of-state. Um, residents, including ours, which was purchased in 2015, which is one of the, the properties that was used in the evaluation. Um, I was interested that there was an inclusion of a, a property in the data set that was substantially smaller than the other properties, which it appears to have skewed the, the average value in the year um, 2016, I think it was. Um, and I also thought that the the market duration analysis wasn't really adequately addressed because there were certainly properties that I'm aware of on the street that were that were not sold during the time period or, or stood, stood on the market for 18 months. Granted, while we were searching for a property from January to June of 2015 and found our property, we lost out on bids and multiple other properties of similar, you know, similar properties in Sandwich, which was the focus of the area that we were looking. And I also um, really disagree with the comparative analysis to other outdoor recreation facilities because the, the factor that's completely missing, and I think um, Ms. Ross sort of touched on it, is there's an ad advantage to being in close proximity to a school or playing fields or other recreational features like that, which is missing from an adventure park like this situation uh, because you know the neighborhood isn't going to be the primary users potentially, you know, attend the Metro Park once or twice a year, maybe if you have family or friends visiting. Um, and re in, in rea reality, the issue that everybody has has to do with the access to the park. Nothing else about the park, I think, that was well represented during the last hearing. Everybody thinks it's a wonderful uh, place, a, a great addition to Sandwich, and we really hope that you consider the impact to the residents and our quality of life, which I think you know, Heritage and their team really hasn't considered that. They've just repackaged their permit application to try to meet new criteria and try to fit it, you know, with a square peg into a round hole into our community. So I hope you consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mello. I don't have my gavel. <laughs> Only we, kidding. We banned him. Thank you, Mr. Chair of the Board. Um, so I, I just want to say I think we're veering a little bit afield with this analysis. I, I respect the Board's decision to um, consider the appraisal analysis, and I, um, I, it's helpful, uh, you know, theoretically. But Why it's would you feel that we're leading astray? It's nuisance hazard of congestion. Right, right but the, the point is that the, the fact is that they're not eligible for a special permit under so, Section 4151, okay. and that ineligibility renders, you know, totally, um, you know, obsolete the whole issue and, and obviates the need to conduct any na analysis with respect to the appraisal. I'm, I'm going to get to the appraisal in a second, but I want to just start out by emphasizing that the conclusion of the building commissioner here with respect to the definition of the word structure can't be overstated. Um, and it's irrefutable for a lot of the reasons that I set forth in my, in my May 8th letter, and I encourage the board to review that letter carefully and also the chart that I prepared with respect to um, the issues that the board has to decide in rendering a decision on the application. I won't belabor those, obviously, today, but I do want to respond to a couple of points made in Heritage's or the applicant's latest submission from um, last Friday. Um, First of all, as I mentioned, or as, I, as is reflected in the materials that I submitted to the board by email this afternoon, it's, it totally contradicts what they expressly acknowledged in their 
submission to Mr. Spiro um, in connection with the, the, the last permit application or you know, the, the last instance in which the town had occasion to consider this issue, Ms. Cox expressly acknowledged that the tree platforms meet the definition of structures in the bylaw. And the, and the reference or the quote that um, Commissioner Brides read from Mr. Spiro's letter a few minutes ago mentioned this fact. He mentioned that they agreed that these tree platforms were structures. That's what he was referring to, that admission in the letter. They also um, acknowledged it in connection with the email correspondence that I attached to my May 8th letter. Um, now, out of expedience, they advanced the new uh, theories, both of which are totally invalid on their face, and, and I'll explain why. And by the way, I want to mention also, because I think it bears emphasis, I hadn't recalled this until I looked back at Mr. Spiro's com uh, uh, correspondence from June 23rd of 2014. He actually found that these tree platforms were buildings independently, so they were structures and buildings. The reason that's significant is that if you look in uh, the zoning bylaw and look at the definition of the word structure, it includes buildings as a freestanding uh, structure, basically, so that irrespective of whether something is attached to something on the ground, if it's a building, that for that reason independently it constitutes a structure. So it's a build, it, it constitutes a structure because it's a building for the reasons that Mr. Spiro explained, and it's a structure under the uh, other terms of the definition of structure. So just so I understand you, the, the, you're defining these platforms as buildings? That, and Mr. Spiro concluded that actually in the June 23rd, 2014 correspondence that Commissioner Brush just read from. Now, the applicant advances these two um, novel theories. First, they say that it's not a structure because it's an element, and those terms are mutually exclusive. As I mentioned at the last hearing and in my correspondence, those terms are not uh, mutually exclusive. In fact, remarkably, as support for that proposition, they quote from the definition of element in 520 CMR 5. And uh, if you actually read the definition, to the contrary, it actually expressly says that an element may be part of a self-supporting structure. That's a verbatim quote. I mean, that uh, on its face expressly contradicts um, Heritage's position uh, with respect to that issue. And remarkably, they cite the definition that expressly contradicts their position. Um, they also advance this, this uh, theory c concocted entirely from whole cloth and, and brand new fashion just for this hearing that the word attached means inherently something that's nailed in. It has to be nailed to or screwed into or bolted to uh, an object to be uh, attached to it. Now, um, uh, obviously that's, you know, that runs counter to the plain terms of the definition. It's brand new. It's inconsistent with their previous position on this issue. Um, and you can imagine the, the ready loophole that creates uh, for builders and homeowners to easily exploit in, you know, asserting that they can circumvent the need for permitting um, by virtue of the fact that they've uh, affixed something or attached something through some, you know, intermediary object that's not technically nailed to or bolted into something. Um, but setting all that aside, it just runs counter to the plain terms of the definition of the word attach. And if you look at the dictionary, um, the dictionary defines attach to mean, uh, among other things, uh, fasten, tie up, strap, adhere, bond, clamp, affix. Now, affix is the word that Heritage itself or the applicant itself used in connection with the board's last review uh, um, of this project um, in its October 23rd, 2014 submission, where it said that visitors make their way from element to element, stopping between elements on platforms affixed to mature sh uh, trees. Um, it, it, so it, they're using, you know, words that expressly contradict their position now. And, and it, I would submit it's just plain common sense. Um, and again, the board would open itself up to a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of problems and issues down the line from people who want to exploit this newly expanded uh, concept or, or this constriction of the definition of the word attached um, to their benefit. Now, with respect, so uh, uh, I'll leave that alone, and I'll encourage the board again to, to read, read carefully through the submissions on this issue. And by the way, I also want to mention, what I would encourage the board to do as an exercise is compare the arguments that Heritage made in its most recent submission and the arguments that we advanced in our May submission. I think you'll find that the vast majority of our arguments are totally unrebutted um, by Heritage's correspondence. Um, now, with respect to the appraisal, Obviously, um, this wasn't proffered before the court. It wasn't, you know, the court 
the court's findings, which again I believe are binding on the board, contradict it. I, I would disagree with you there. Oh well, again, and if respectfully, if if even if you might make a hyper technical legal argument that it, this isn't race judicata or collateral estoppel, again, a, a court as a practical matter would look at the fact that this issue was thoroughly vetted before the court. It was decided by the court, and you know the concept that someone could come along without the opportunity to cross-examine or be cross-examined and offer, you know, largely anecdotal um, uh, evidence to contradict something that a court concluded um, in a decision that is fully adjudicated, I think as a practical matter, you know, I, I, the, the board would have a hard time defending um, a position like that in an appeal. Okay. Um, but so, but even setting that aside, if you look at the merits, okay, and if you drill down to this analysis, it really, on its face, it some suffers from two fundamental defects, which, uh, in my view, warrant totally disregarding it. And that is, first of all, what you don't what you need to show. That this analysis says basically, the look property values haven't decreased since the park opened. That's not a relevant question. That's not the issue. What you have to look at is what the property values in the neighborhood are with the park and without the park. That's something that our appraiser um, and our expert uh, analyst on this issue thoroughly vetted with the court. And the court found that the, proper, the, the introduction of this park into this neighborhood resulted in a diminution of values in the neighborhood with respect to the plaintiff's properties below which, uh, uh, below the value that they would have been without the park. That's the relevant question. And that's something that's wholly unaddressed in the submission. Now, I understand that the appraiser, um, the, the applicant's appraiser, submitted some information tonight, which w didn't accompany their previous submission, which I haven't had the benefit of, review of reviewing. But based on her description of it, it, it sounds like basically what she did is she compared how values have changed since the park opened um, without, without any analysis of how property values have changed with respect to properties that are comparable to the properties in the neighborhood or to high-view condominiums. That's okay. an essential component. It's something to just totally disregarded. Okay, I understand um, that you want me to... Um, Please move along. Yeah. Uh, just briefly, the okay. study that you're referring to, when was that completed? Well, the study... The one that, was, that you used or was used in court. When was that study completed? We've never seen that study. So and I'm happy to provide it. When was it completed? It was completed in connection with the, when, the lawsuit. No, when? when was it completed? When was the analysis completed? I, I don't know. The analysis was completed in connection with the case. And date, please, year. I mean, we retained the expert in years ago. I mean, I, I'm not sure. So 2015, 2016, I don't remember the exact date. And obviously, the trial was conducted in 2017. It was completed prior to the park even opening in 17? The, the park opened in 2015. So no, the, the park opened in, in the, park in the park opened in 2015. Now, obviously, the the appraiser looked at data from times preceding the park's opening. If that's your question, right? Yeah. yeah. So until until when? So he, how much data do you? It was to? pretty close until the time of trial. I mean, I think we we tried it in December uh, in um, October through December of 2017, and I think we supplemented. Um, our disclosures, if I recall correctly, sometime in late September or early October. So it was, it was, the study was probably completed yeah. sometime in the middle of 17, maybe the fall of 17, so it was prepared. For well, she was, she was reviewing data in connection with the case for, you know, I would say the entirety of her engagement. But with respect to the testimony that was presented or the materials that were presented in court, I think that um, they were updated as of I don't know, let's say mid-September to late or to early October, perhaps of 2017. Um, so, the, but the other defect with respect to the the, the applicant's uh, um, appraisal information is that uh, so it, in addition to not considering comps and not considering uh, the condition with and without the project, um, they she does this paired sales analysis, um, which is totally flawed insofar as it measures properties, first of all, that are geographically distant from and not in any way connected with the project, including properties outside of Sandwich. Um, but they're also, 
what, what's compared is the values of properties near ball fields and school-related athletic facilities and uh, properties that are exclusively residential or in exclusively residential neighborhoods without those things. The reason that that's not relevant at all is that, as I mentioned at my last, uh, in my, the last session of the hearing, people actually are attracted to communities based on proximity to things like, you know, uh, school-related ball fields and the like. They, they want to, that makes the community attractive to them, the quality of their schools well, and the school-related effort. question, did she yeah. give an answer that some people preferred, some don't, so it, it was, it was, I think, analysis that was important to, to look at. She was trying to well, give us an example of, of how certain things are affected by other factors, so I think it had some relevance. I, I certainly learned something from reading it, so I don't think it's, it's any criticism well, no, look I'm, it, uh, what I'm saying is it's not um, it's not relevant to the question or to the impact of the project on the neighborhood properties um, I, okay. I don't think it's sufficiently connected now um, with respect to the no. visitor accounts I just one more point okay. if I may um, and I had more but I'll, I'll, I'll cap it at this um, the visitor accounts first of all uh, I heard uh, mr. Azam um, suggest that on a busy day you're you'll get 250 visitors that we have actually daily visitor counts that were introduced as trial exhibits which reflect that actually on a typical busy day in the summertime and the visitor counts are almost double that i mean there 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 are several days for which it was i, I don't know if what they submitted to you because um, i haven't seen that does it include daily totals yep. okay okay so you'll see there there are several days for which they had 350 plus 400 um visitors the, and I also want I think this point is important to emphasize because it, it could get lost you can't in considering the the visitor totals you can't just look at what they've been historically because those are artificially low and the reason is that throughout the course of the litigation and read read the submission from May 8th it, it details this throughout the litigation they were um, employing means to artificially reduce their visitor totals for, for the benefit of the litigation. They were contemplating all sorts of means to improve visitor counts, as you would imagine, as any business would. How do they do that exactly? What's that? How do they do that exactly? How do they discourage people from coming? No, no. What I'm saying is there were all sorts of strategies that they intended to employ post-litigation to drive up visitor counts. And you can rest assured that they'll do that. And, and when I say that, I'm not suggesting that they intend to uh, expand the courses. They've said very clearly, we need further permitting for that. Now, w look, as a practical matter, <laughs> you know, don't kid a kidder. I mean, this is a camel's nose under the tent type of thing. I'm sure that in, if, we're, if, if permitted, it wouldn't surprise me um, if we were back here years from now, um, you know, seeking to add courses. But, but I want to say, putting that aside, okay, there are all sorts of means through which you can drive up these visitor totals without doing anything that would require permitting, including harnesses. Actual. In no, increasing harnesses. I think they've proved their point that these are fairly factual enough for our purposes. No, but time. right. But if I may say one more one more line, what I'm saying is that they they had contemplated and and these are in trial exhibits. I'm happy to provide them to the board. Adding harnesses and adding basically intake stations, basically in reducing the time of a ticket to increase the number of visitors to the park without doing anything that would require additional permitting. But they're telling us they haven't done that, they don't intend to. No, I, the, the, what they said is they don't intend to expand the park physically. Correct. And, but these, these measures wouldn't require any physical expansion of the park. Even if you want to take them at face value um, and believe them that, that they don't intend in the future to expand the park physically. I, I'm not going to comment on that other than say, look at the excerpts that I quoted um, from the trial exhibits and I mean there's an abundance of information that to reflect that they were they intended all these measures and were, were avoiding them solely for expedience in connection with the litigation but okay thank you very much am I am I being cut off You're now excused you can come back at the end okay, thank you <laughs> All right, like I said, if anybody else would like to speak, please just keep it, keep it, keep it to something that we haven't heard from you before uh, and try be. to keep it concise. Yeah. And put your name on the list, please. Aye, aye. Thank you.
me, I see if this is really on. It's not on, right? It is. Yeah. It is. It's really on. Yes, Can you hear me that well? well? Can you hear me that well now? Could, could you Are you sure this is on? Could you state your name? <laughs> yeah, you can. All right. I just asked because I'm sitting right here and I'm having a great deal of difficulty right. hearing anyone that's sitting here other than myself <laughs> speak. Okay? So there may be a way to turn it on because if we can, we get a lot more volume. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, members of the board, uh, my name is Dick Harries. I'm at 10 Morgan Trail. I did speak earlier. Uh, I had some comments regarding statements made at the previous meeting, and I can't write fast enough. I'm trying to keep these here. Could I make just a comment as one that's sitting and listening? Sure you I can. get the feeling here that this board does not have a very high regard for Judge Moriarty and the Superior Court rule. This is, we're not talking about Judge Moriarty, but this is a new application from the board with all new information. What is all new information? This the, uh, complete uh, presentation by the applicant uh, I, under a different I'm going, by quote, the I'm going to quote some of the things she's talking about, and you're going to find I'm not going to repeat anything that I repeated last time. Okay. But I will mention the ruling, because the ruling is very critical to this particular group. You've been here before. I don't want you here again. Uh, I have a few comments I'd like to make. Uh, Unfortunately for the town, this new proposal from Heritage again pits neighbor against neighbor, and that is too bad. And almost all the comments in favor, which were last week, but I think these comments have been made, were that this is really a great opportunity. It's a great fun event. There is no argument from the protagonists or from the people who are, are opposed to this. It is a neat device. Lots of people have a lot of fun on it. But unfortunately, it's uh, not comp compatible on a number of grounds with the character of the neighborhood. Yet I hear someone telling me that what you're proposing, by the way, did anyone notice that that poor young lady who went first didn't know what we were calling this thing for all these years? However, she, she, uh, she never used anything other than a ropes course de describing what took place in the past. I don't know. Uh, but under the law, it's in question here, not whether it's popular or not, but whether it is OK. In interpreting the proper application of the bylaw, the judge did state that the construction of a zoning enactment is ultimately a judicial function, and therefore subject to, judi to judicial review and rulings. You would understand that better than most. Surely, you must also understand the judge's ruling presents a major judicial block to any permitting activity that you would consider that fails to remove his ruling. I hope you had a chance to read his ruling because he mentioned many things in that ruling. Right? Uh, we believe in the end that the sandwich bylaw will remain the bulwark for all its citizens against a lot of noise that's being made about unlawful uses and activities. Now, I sense some confusion, and I would like to just spend a couple of minutes on it. Last time, when the order for judgment, with the hope of clarifying it. Under the rulings of law, the judge focused on three areas. Building permit, Dover Amendment, and the protection of property values under the bylaw. All three were dealt with in his order for judgment. The building permit was covered. The town felt it was protected under the Dover Amendment, which waived applicability of state zoning law and sandwich bylaw and allowed a commercial enterprise in an island district. The Zoning Board of Appeals upheld the granting of that permit because of the Dover Amendment. Upon legal review in a civil suit, the judge ruled the Dover Amendment did not apply. That said, without the Dover Amendment, all applicable bylaw protections now apply, and the judge ruled the decision was made on legally untenable grounds. Excuse Result me, sir. sir we, we understand that. We've, we've read the, the, the ruling. 
And I, I don't we thought it was you, the Dover Amendment applied. You, you, we thought the Dover Amendment applied. The judge didn't. So be it. We I'm, move on. I'm sorry, what? I said, we thought the Dover Amendment applied. The judge disagreed. So be it. We move on. This, the, that, that is not before us now. So we're, we're talking about a special permit you are asking for. I would just say, and I'll, and I'll cut this short, because if Please. you say that you can overrule the Superior Court judge. No, we didn't say that. No, 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 no. Said it no, didn't we, didn't, we, did, we did not say that. The, the, the per permit came before us as, as to is it, a, is it the Dover Amendment or not. We yep. thought it applied. We did not disagree with the judge or okay. overturn the judge. The judge overturned us. That's it. Simple case closed. Okay. Let's move on. Let's go. Uh, here I go. Two weeks ago, here at a previous Open ZBA meeting, I again heard a lot of lawyers speak. One of the comments made stated, this board is not bound in its valuation of special permit under the zoning bylaw by the Superior Court determination, etc." Although this statement was in reference to standing, it sums up Heritage's attitude and the contempt for the Superior Court's judgment. It applies. As you weigh what you read and hear, I want to remind you of the roles being played out before you. Lawyers and applicants are speaking. They allege a judge has spoken. He judges. Don't look for answers in post-trial allegations and testimonies. That ship has sailed. But it left some reminders of just how much the neighbor's trust in Heritage Museum and Gardens has eroded over the past few years. Here are just two. All items. right, let's just please move it along. I'm coming. Four years ago, the applicant here in this room alleged before you that they were protected under the Dover Amendment because the AAP was primarily educational. The judge adjudged that was untrue and therefore, Dover protection did not apply. Secondly, for the last four years, the applicant has alleged and certified on multiple town documents that the AAP was located on lot six. The judge adjudged that, too, was untrue. When is enough going to be enough and some truth come out? Approval of the application before the Zoning Board of Appeals will be a wrongful attempt to overrule the findings of the court, which is unlawful use. That's unlawful use against our bylaw. Okay, thank you, sir. Additionally, such decision please, please. counter. Please, excuse me. Let's move on. All right. Thank you. Well, I, I think I thank you. No, I think we understand where, where you're coming from. Uh, all right, I, I do, but we need to spend more time reading what someone of authority has said. Thank you. He spent hours Thank you. going over. Thank you. Would you think you don't the spend hours doing our work? Thank you. <laughs> All right, Carl. Almost fell over backwards. You sure you don't have that gavel in? No. All right. <laughs> okay. This is all going to be new. And it will be relatively brief. Thank you. <laughs> On the application, uh, Heritage uh, applied for our operating a course as a small scale outdoor recreational uh, facility pursuant to Section 4150. The first thing Heritage is attempting to do to change, and I don't know why, is to extract the word community. In the bylaw, it says, Here's what the bylaw says, small scale community recreational sports field and facilities. Now they may have great stuff they're showing you tonight. And they may have shown you what you think is great stuff previous to this. But we have to remember two things, well, especially one thing. And this is uh, the most important question. What is this zoning board's definition of small-scale community, as those words are used in the bylaw for 4150. It's essential tonight that small-scale and community be defined. If this zoning board 
of Appeals cannot give us a definition of small scale, scale in community, how is this zoning board going to vote? Zoning, the zoning board cannot vote on what they can't define. In other words, you have to be able to say to this people, okay, this is what we're going to establish a small scale, and this will go henceforth. And we're going to let you guys talk about small scale, because we don't think small scale community is something where you have 30,000 people a year coming up your street. We think it's a baseball field that's used every so often. It's a, uh, a uh, basketball court like down by the wing school that's used every so often. It might even be a little uh, association thing like down at the end of Caius Way that's used every so often. Certainly not 30,000 people a year. 30,000 people a year is big business by a company that owns nine such adventure parks. Big business. That's what we're talking about. We're <laughs> not talking about small scale community. So, before you vote, you should be able to turn and look at all these people and say, this is what small scale community is and this is what we're voting on. You have that yeah, duty. We'll do that. That'll be part of our deliberation. Loud and clear. But it should be before we're all through speaking because somebody might have a comment. You know what I mean? We will keep the hearing open, don't you worry. <laughs> so you, you'll come up with the definition, keep the hearing open. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, anyone else would like to speak? Pro or con, please, come on up. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. My name, my name is Eric Small. My comments are in part attributed to Kaz Malik. Kaz and I both live on Jonathan Lane. A quote from Kaz, who wouldn't be here, says, the ropes course at Heritage is in the wrong place. In fairness, gentlemen, please ask yourselves, if Heritage did not exist, would the majority owner of this commercial enterprise be permitted to install and operate at this location? If your true answer is no, then you are in agreement with the ruling of the Superior Court that it's an unlawful use. And with respect, it must be permanently closed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else, please? three doors from Heritage. I don't want to be in this chair. 
I've moved here in 1983 and have been a neighbor since that time. My comments are looking back. My apologies, Ann. I'm not looking forward. I just met Ann tonight for the first time. I know Heather well, who has been the acting director. My um, business, I have been a consultant to nonprofit organizations, including Heritage, in the past. This project started out of the gate with deception. It continued deceptively. In spite of the fact that the deception was pointed out early on, right in the beginning, it continued. It took the court to exercise the discipline that the board should have exercised. What should have happened was there should have been a time when the board said, time out, we made a mistake, <clears throat> we want this to go forward, and we're going to start again. But that didn't happen. It took the court to exercise the discipline. I've been on many boards of nonprofits, and as I said, I've consulted with them. I understand sustainability. I understand that a nonprofit organization has to revitalize itself. It has to be constantly changing to keep itself going and to be sustainable. The Peabody Essex Museum, the oldest marine museum in the United States, was, dis was fighting the same sustainability issues. They went and bought a 2,000 square foot Chinese house out of China, took it apart, brought it to Peabody Essex, and installed it right in the middle of their museum. And it has brought untold numbers to the organization. There's probably plenty, plenty of people in this room that have stood there like I have in awe of, of the, the experience that I was having that I couldn't have had. That was an organization that made a decision based upon their values, based upon their mission, and based upon the history and those who'd gone before it. And it was consistent with their values, and it, and, and it increased the value of the surrounding community. Closer to home, Cape Cod Museum of Natural History. Mr. Cope, can you kind of address what's in front of us instead of these other projects? Because I am. Not relevant. I am. Cape Cod Museum of Natural History needed to address sustainability. They didn't put in a zip line. They put in a butterfly house consistent with the values that they were preaching and had been preaching. I have a concern that doesn't deal with heritage. And that is that if this gets passed, what are we saying to future organizations, both within, the org both within our community and outside of our community, that want to move selfishly towards their own interest? What are we saying to them? We're setting a precedent. That scares me. You folks, the Historic Commission and others, and we have our fun poking at some of the decisions that are made by both organizations, have a responsibility, and it has been well handled in the past. We only need to look at 6A versus Route 28A, or 28. 
<coughs> to see the differences between our communities. This is a community of value. You have contributed to that by the decisions you've made in the past. The wrong decision here is not going to be an answer if to vote in favor of this is only going to compound this problem. It's time to move on. Heritage has new leadership. Heritage has lost a lot of members based upon the behavior of past performance. It's time to heal, and it's time to move on. And the one way to do that is to let this go and go after sustainability in a way that is far more conducive to the history of the organization and the values. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Coe. Anyone else like to speak? Anybody out back in the foyer like to speak? Anybody out back there want to speak? Okay, we're good. Oh, yes, I'd please. Like speak. Yeah. I'd like to respond to those comments. You go right ahead. I'm the leader of Heritage. We have leadership. We're looking at her. You're sitting next to board members on our board of trustees. You're looking at our leadership. Thank you. Now, a couple, just a couple of things I'd like to say, because I'm sorry, I don't think, Mr. Coe, that you were at the last hearing. Were you? Yes. Okay. That's, I'm glad that you were, but I would just like to say that we did address values at that meeting. And um, I don't necessarily think that these comments were particularly pertinent to this case, but I just simply would like to respond that the Adventure Park is an extension of our values. The values of families working together, the values of education, or an outreaching force for education, and the value of discovery in nature. You've heard this before, I don't need to say it again, but I simply would like to write the ship back to upright um, with respect to this as being an extension of our values. Um, I also, oh shoot, I just lost my thought. Um, I simply wanted to say that I do believe um, the question about community, that I did speak before about community benefit, and um, I would simply like to underscore the fact that there's a lot of community benefit from the Adventure Park that's very positive, and it has to do with um, schools and other groups that use it, um, as well as the neighbors who use it. So um, I'm going to leave it at that but I would simply like to try to write things back um, to where they were and, um, and underscore that this project is an extension of our mission, it's an extension of our values, and it's not, um, that's not exactly the question on the table anyway. Right. Um, but I would simply like to say that we know who we are, we know what our mission is, we know what our values are, and we respect that you're keeping the conversation on the, on the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, before we hear from Mr. Mello again, would anybody like to speak? Mr. Chairman, could I respond to a few of the comments? Sure, go ahead. First, I, I want to be very clear that there is no contempt here for the Superior Court decision. Immediately when the Superior Court decision issued, Heritage and the Adventure Park closed, fully consistent with the Superior Court decision. In addition, this whole application is consistent with the Superior Court decision. As I mentioned previously, in finding that this was not dominantly educational, the court found that it was dominantly recreational. And here we are seeking a rec recreation special permit, outdoor recreation special permit. Um, in addition, there were comments made regarding that the Superior Court uh, determined uh, that there was a, a loss in property value. That was for four properties, four properties, the plaintiff's properties. What we have presented to you through Mrs. Ross's analysis is how this project impacts the neighborhood. And as her report indicates, there is no negative uh, market impact with it to the neighborhood as a whole as a result of this project. 
Finally, as it relates to Mr. DePercio's comments about um, what the criteria is, that's the board's, that's in your discretion. You have to uh, review the terms and apply them to the application that's before you. And I would suggest in terms of whether it's a small scale, you just, you look at the criteria of the zoning bylaw. And again, the criteria of 4151 directly relates to the scale and ensures that anything that comes under that application and it has to meet each criteria that ensures that it is small scale and as Ann mentioned the record that we've submitted is replete with community benefit how this project creates local jobs access to schools a, a venue for emergency responders and you've heard tremendous positive comment from the community in support of this application and then finally getting back to the question of whether the the platforms are structures again I would reiterate that Mr. Spira's testimony from October of 2017 determined that they were not structures but elements. It is our position that platforms are not attached to something on the ground. The platforms are, are um, they're not structures because they're not affixed to the ground, they're not located on the ground, they're not in a fixed location on the ground, and they're not attached to anything constructed on the ground. They are not structures under your zoning bylaw, consistent with what the building commissioner previously found. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Mello. No. No, you no need. Been, you, now you've been quite eloquent, and I think you've covered all your bases. So please just try to cover what you haven't covered and be as succinct as possible. Absolutely. I, I don't want to. Trust me, I don't want to waste anyone's time, and I appreciate it. I, if I could just address one um, one of the last comments that Attorney uh, Cox made. This is something that I meant to say. Um, and it, first go around this, this uh, right. evening. N let me be clear, and, and, and it's reflected in my May submission, but Mr. Spiro, um, and I understand testimony from the trial has been quoted, you know, or an excerpt from testimony has been quoted, um, but he explained the basis for that reversal uh, in email communications, internal e email communications with members or, or town officials that, um, that were introduced as evidence at trial. And I'm happy to get copies uh, if the board wishes, but he said, and I think this summarizes concisely why he reversed his position, uh, that he hoped to give Ms. Spear, the, the predecessor uh, CEO of Heritage, the impression that we are helping her along with the project by not denying and having her go before the ZBA requesting an appeal of my zoning opinion, which I believe would not get overturned. I mean, it couldn't be clear why he reversed his position. And, uh, it, but that doesn't derogate from the fact that in his heart of hearts, he had actually professionally uh, arrived at the same conclusion that Commissioner Brides correctly arrives at in finding that these are uh, structures and buildings, these tree platforms. Um, I also wanted to just respond to one point that um, the applicant advanced in its May 24th letter to the effect that this is unequivocally a challenge course. Um, again, I, I just want to emphasize, because I, I don't want this to get lost in the thicket of, of details that the board has been um, uh, inundated with here. Regardless of what people considered it pre-Superior Court judgment, following the court's judgment, this cannot be considered a challenge course, even if people thought it was before and if it was licensed um, as such before. Because there is no, and, and this can't be disputed in view of the court's ruling, there is no supervised uh, curriculum associated with this activity. It's a totally self-guided activity. There's no supervised curriculum. That requirement is expressly contained within the definition of challenge course in the state regulations. This Forgive me a second, Mr. Miller. Sure. Um, is it, didn't they tell us that there was a half hour class on instructions before you could go on the course? You can't just walk up, pay a ticket, and jump on the course and go. You right. have to go through a 30-minute. I, th I think it's actually, I think the testimony of the trial was to the effect that it's 15 minutes. But that, let me, uh, and let me just clarify that that, and, and we can produce testimony and, and trial exhibits that support this concept as well. That was exclusively to show people how to strap themselves into their harnesses, basically. It's, it, this, it's not, that can't be plausibly, you know, characterized as any bona fide curriculum uh, or supervised curriculum as the, the state regulations intend. Look, okay. Okay. there's Point plenty taken. of, and there's, pl there's plenty of uh, literature from the aerial adventure park industry itself that I, uh, that I accompanied or that I attached to my May 8th letter that reflects that the, the aerial adventure park industry itself, and a ASTM standards reflect this, and the white paper that I attached to my May 8th submission reflects this, okay. that they regard it. Can the applicant respond to your point? 
No, they, but they haven't, and that was contained in my. Oh, uh, she'd like to respond yeah. to what you're saying at the moment. So let's listen. The court never evaluated whether there was a recreational curriculum associated with this project. That's absurd. All the court found was that this was not a dominantly educational use. Of course there's a recreational curriculum. You get up, you have elements to, to navigate and to, to pass through. It, there's a, a, by its very structure, there's a recreational curriculum associated with this use. And that was never before the court. You know, and, and let me respond to that. The, it, the, the actual definition ref, refers to a supervised curriculum. And the court emphasized that this is a totally self-guided uh, activity. And basically, that, that proposition would strip curriculum of any meaning. It would render basically anything uh, sufficient to cor uh, constitute curriculum, um, which you know, is, is not the case. I think you know, it's, it's self-evident that that's not true. But, Respectfully, um, but Mr. Chairman, the so court if never I can, ruled if I can whether proceed without the being interrupted, I, I, that, and I, I wasn't given the opportunity to interrupt uh, Attorney right. Cox during no, her I presentation. Just, but while you were here talking, that it would be best if you got to pull that out. Okay, move on, Mr. Mello. Thank you. Um, with respect to the, um, the appraisal analysis, now, again, putting aside any hyper-technical legal arguments that, that you want to... Now, didn't we, I mean... But no, but, but, but one question that, that arose, which I, I want to respond to, I don't feel like having fully vetted this with the court and establishing a diminution of value, like we should really have to um, present a whole lot of information to the board to establish that proposition. But if the board uh, is inclined to, you know, rule adversely with respect to um, the opposition on that issue, I would request an opportunity to provide the board with trial exhibits and testimony th that served as the basis for the court's correct conclusion um, that this project resulted in a diminution of value of my properties in the neighborhood. Was there a written report, some of the report that Ms. Ross presented to us from those days that we could review? Absolutely. Well, there, there were, um, I can't recall if there was a narrative that was submitted as part of the trial record. There, there was right in front of us, we have yep. a report from a very legitimate organization stating that there were property improvement, uh, real estate value improvements. Do you have something similar to that? We have, we have exhibits that, um, that basically summarize the results of our expert appraiser's um, analysis of the, the property values with and without the park based on comps. So, and that, th those are trial exhibits, and I believe there may have been a narrative, there's certainly plenty of testimony w in which she fully substantiates her findings to the, again, to the court's uh, approval. So where I'm happy to provide the, the board with all that information. I w it's been adjudicated. Um, I, I would, I'd be um, surprised if the board reasonably, you know, could conclude um, that there were any, uh, you know, would disagree with the court's conclusions in this regard. I, that would surprise me, but I'm happy to provide all that. And she actually, the, the trial um, exhibits that we offered to this, uh, to support these conclusions were, I would say, more detailed than the analysis that's been proffered by the applicant. But this is the only one we have. Right, and that's what I'm saying. If, if the board, I, I guess I perhaps uh, incorrectly um, suspected that the board wouldn't put upon us the obligation of having to Relitigate something that we fully vetted with the court and that the court decided in our favor. But if, if the board, if the board's not, uh, notwithstanding that, wants to see our appraisal analysis, I would re request an opportunity to present that to the board. Um, was that analysis done um, exclusively for the four uh, plaintiff's houses, or was it? Was there any neighborhood analysis that accompanied it? Yeah, good question. As I think, if I recall, and I don't remember all the particulars of it, but um, the as uh, sort of as of necessity in order to um, substantiate her conclusions with, the res with respect to the four properties at issue in the litigation, she had to analyze comps inside and outside of the neighborhood. Like, for example, at Hill Hilltop, um, there are some properties at Hilltop that were analyzed in connection with her testimony um, and, and comps outside the neighborhood, which is critical. And that, again, that's something that's totally omitted from um, the appraisal analysis that was submitted to the board uh, in connection with the application tonight and uh, previously. Um, so yeah, we, we have, there was, there, it wasn't, our exhibits weren't confined to those, um, those summaries that I explained where she went through. I, I, it read almost like a spreadsheet, as I recall. It, was, it basically enumerated in, in um, excellent detail, I think, the bases, which, what she was actually looking at when she was comparing these properties. 
Bob, is that something that, that you feel we need to? Well, I mean, the applicant has come in front of us to meet the litmus test of 4151. Mm -hmm. And one of that, uh, um, actually, it's not under 4150. No, it's not. Right. Yeah, I know that. Um, but the contention was that this special permit would be detrimental to the neighborhood and it would have adverse effects on the property values. Mm -hmm. The applicant has given us uh, documentation that it will not or has not made any change in that. And if they, if someone in the public has something that differs with that, I don't have a problem looking at it. But it's not like we're on trial here where there's, uh, you know, we've got two sides against another. This is an application. They've given us the information. If you want to give us something, go ahead. Okay, thank you. And, and I, but just to clarify one point, the, the analysis doesn't actually show. What it shows is that purportedly, since the project was introduced, property values have increased in the neighborhood. But that's not the relevant question. Again, the question yes, it is. Yes, no, it isn't. The question is, how is the value different with the project from what it would be without the project? That analysis can be conducted. That was what was reviewed. Uh, absolutely. If you. Alleged the property values have declined as a result of this. You know, but, but let me be clear. If, if property values, let's say, for example, theoretically, there's some um, major economic boom that results in a dramatic increase in real estate values nationwide, okay? You introduce a, 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 a project uh, into a neighborhood, it's not going to stem the increase in values, but it's going to, it's going to limit the increase below what it would be otherwise. And that is a diminution in value. If my, pro if my property, and by the way, the diminution here is, is tens of thousands of dollars with respect to the plaintiff's property. These aren't, these aren't, aren't insignificant decreases. If, if my property, the let's just. The of the, of the report that it really didn't have any difference, that it was very similar to air property in the, in the rest of the area? No, that's the thing. That's the, that's the fundamental flaw. And I'm, I'm glad you raised this. That's the problem with this analysis. It does not do that. It, do, it looks at it in a vacuum. It doesn't compare it with how comps townwide have fared since the project was introduced, or other means through which you can ascertain uh, or, or arrive at these conclusions. All, it just looks at it in a vacuum. It says, well, since the project was introduced, property values uh, have risen. You know, that's illogical on its face, because if you think about it, all you have to do is adjust the relevant you know, duration of the period you're looking at. And like, for example, if, if the project were introduced in 2000, let's say, okay, no one disputes that since 2000, property values have increased. But if the property would be valued at twice as much without the project as it would be today with the project, then how can you say that it hasn't resulted in diminution in value? Of course it has. The property is half the value that it would have been without the project, notwithstanding the fact that since it was introduced, yeah, predictably, real estate values have changed. I, I talked to a guy who told me you could buy something in Back Bay in 1960 for $4,000. Know, so okay. I, I think that's self-evident. Um, so your point is that the diminution of values it's still positive, but it's not as positive as... But, and I don't know that it's still positive. I don't that. believe that, because that's it's, not what the report showed. That's right. The report showed that the general condo population um, uh, valuation for the town of Sandwich, I believe, was... Uh, six, yeah, it was comparable. It was comparable. Yeah, 35% increase in that five-year period. 35 versus 20. And it, is that in the information that was submitted to the yeah. board tonight? or, or no, more? It was in the report from Ms. Ross. Yeah. But not, I don't believe that it, the, the measurement was of condos town-wide, but even if it was, it's right there. It, even if it was, it, it's, you have to look at comps. You, it, you can't just look at it in a vacuum like that because there could be condos town-wide that, um, that are not appropriate comps. Okay, we we'll get your point. All right, let's move Am on. I right? So, well, okay. okay. We understand oh. your valuation issue and, and really would like to get this role. Okay. Up. Okay. So, and I'm happy to submit um, our appraisal analysis to the board. Fine. Um, and I just want to, one more, one more point, something that uh, Mr. DiPersio, uh, a comment that he mentioned that I think bears emphasis, and that is that um, this definition of small scale community um, uh, activity that, you know, I don't think you need to actually draw any conclusion with respect to what that means because they're ineligible on other grounds before you even get there. But if you do get to that question, the board can't really decide that or it wouldn't be appropriate, in my opinion, to decide that question without availing itself of the means through which we can actually actually ascertain what town meeting intended <laughs> when it adopted that language. You can yeah, look at town meeting. As, as you know, the yeah. planning board 
request the definitions, they write the definitions, they either get approved at town meeting or they don't, and then we just have to define the way we feel they read. So we, we can't make a definition of small scale, then put it in the manual. No, but well you can, what I'm saying is you can look at, for example, materials, backup materials associated with that town meeting no, article. Correct, but there's a definition in there of what fits a small scale, and that's what we have to go by at this point in time. Uh, well, well, no, that... No, not, it's not arguable. No, I, I it is arguable, actually. And, and it, no, the, no, the, 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 the zoning bylaw provision, and I, I know Attorney Cox is, is um, has proffered this um, this theory. It's actually incorrect that the the we zoning bylaw defines small scale by those elements under 4151. We look at the definition that is in the manual provided to us, approved by town meeting, and we interpret it as best we can based on the special permit that's presented to us. So okay. Case closed. Fair enough. I, I'm I'm just saying that you can actually look at what the draft is intended the language to mean by looking at the town meeting warrant article, the backup materials, perhaps, uh, you know, reviewing town meeting minutes to, to ascertain, for example, suppose there was a, a, a comment from a floor explaining by the, by the proponents of the article that what we mean by small scale community uh, activities and when we put that qualifying language in the definition of outdoor recreation, what we mean by that is just ball fields. Um, you but know. they didn't. Yeah. No, but, but you don't, that my, that's my point. We don't know that. The board, the board could avail itself of the means to ascertain that, is my point. And I, I would suggest that if you're going to decide that this, uh, and you don't have to get to this question, actually, as I mentioned, but if you're going to get to this question and decide that this is a small scale community activity, it's not appropriate for the board to do that without at least checking to see what town meeting said about that issue. I believe that's been done, and, and we are looking, but. Oh typical towns, there's not a whole lot there. Okay. Okay, so we, we'll, we'll do our due diligence. That's the okay. one thing we always do. Yep. So we're fine. Oh, fair enough. All right. And finally, I just want to say one more thing. Um, All right. Now, finally, that's... It's not... It, I want to thank the board. No, I appreciate it. I, w I want to thank the board um, for allowing me to uh, present. And I, I think this is known, uh, but I just want to um, emphasize it because, um, it, you know, it, it has not been lost on me that you probably have only been acquainted with me over the years through the litigation, um, and probably just the mere sight of my name has, has raised the blood pressure of some of you. And, uh, Honestly, I had no idea who you were when you showed up. No, and I don't, I didn't look, that's great. Um, you're not alone, but, um, but my, my point is to the extent that there's, you know, that there's any inherent um, ill will, um, it's not the way we okay. are. I, we've, 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 this board's been together for 13, time. 15 years. Yep. They're always fair. We always listen. We always do our due diligence, and we do the best we can. It has nothing to do with who's before us. Okay, I, I respect that. I just, I, I wanted to make, um, I wanted to be explicit about that because um, there's nothing yeah. personal. You, you Obviously, know. boards under 40A17 are required to be named as parties um, in any legal challenge under that provision. All so, right. thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I have a question. I've been listening to all the pros and cons here. And I have a question in regards to what is what we are going to call a structure and what we are not going to call a structure. I hear I hear the applicants say that the tree is not an app is not a, a structure. I hear the town uh, zoning by law says it is. We have a legal town council here. What I'd like to know is what is the legal town council's opinion on whether that's a structure or it's not a structure? Is that possible to obtain tonight? Sure. Town council. <laughs> <laughs> you, thought, you thought you were sitting over there quietly. <laughs> um, the zoning bylaw defines structure, and ultimately it is the building inspector's job in the first instance to interpret that definition. Um, to the extent anybody disagrees with that, they have the option of bringing that question before you as a Zoning Board of Appeals, and you are the ultimate arbiter of what that definition means and whether it applies to this particular project and structure. If anybody disagrees with that interpretation, they have the ability to seek further judicial review of that interpretation. Um, so I'm not sure my opinion necessarily matters here, um, but certainly you have a definition and, and the building inspector and the board can choose to interpret that and apply it. 
Thank you. And I, I understand your response. You knew that go around the circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why we. No. To the extent that the building commissioner has rendered that interpretation and that determination, any reversal of that would require its own independent presentation. Yes, we understand. As opposed to that question being decided, or the building commissioner's determination of that question being decided in the context of this application. I, I, I disagree with that, Mr. Chairman. You have an application before you that requires you to evaluate how the zoning bylaw applies to a particular project in, in front of you, including whether the elements of this project meet the definitions or not. So this is squarely before the board to make Correct. that determination. Thank you. I disagree with the uh, town council. 104. Excuse me. What, what, Carl, what, what do you disagree with? She, yeah. she was very correct in her response. But she said you have the ultimate uh, decision on what you do. Yes. 104.12, now that's not provided for in the building code, 780 CMR takes precedence. Building code no. or what? Pardon me? What are you talking about? I'm talking about that it says that if, because things in the building industry change constantly, that there are matters that they can't cover. That's what they say in this paragraph. And they say the building inspector. Is that here? That, is that the building I code? It's, I think it's a reference to the building code. The building code. Some Our purview it's right here. is zoned by law. And the definitions that are it's in there in are there. what we go by. No. Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, you don't go to the building code. No. We don't. Nope. We can't. Nope. We don't go to Title V code. We don't go to chemical code, we go to this code right here. This is all so, so people can build in this town without following the building code? No, no that's, that's the building that's, inspector. That's the building department. Oh, well, okay. And so he can say it's it's a structure. And that's the final word. He, no, it isn't. We're the final word. We just, just said that. So you can say it's not a structure. So you can say this building's not a structure? With it regards to special permits and variances. You can say this building, you can say this building is not a structure. We, we have to determine based on the definitions and the rules in here, we interpret them. And we actually, the building inspector has to abide by our decision. Okay, so th just, I won't be labeled, I promise you. But if you have a, a platform, 30, you are making this decision. If you got a platform 30 feet off the ground and you got 10 little kids on it, mm -hmm. you're saying you can say it's not a structure and doesn't have to be inspected? We, I didn't say anything about inspections. I just said we can define it as, as one thing or another. The inspection, the safety aspect of it is up to the state. And not for the platforms. Yes, yeah, it, it is. They do the inspections. They do the third party inspection on cables and elements. They don't inspect the platforms. Platforms and elements. Pla they don't inspect platforms. Well, I'm not going to argue with you because I'm not, it's not within our purview, but safety is so, not. So if, so if a little kid falls off the structure, which just happened down in uh, Virginia, 40 feet, slipped off the platform. You're saying that's, you're, you're covered, you're all set. There's nothing, nothing we have no to do with that. Over that whatsoever. So you're saying you can't say it is or isn't a platform? We, can do, we have the responsibility to define it under our bylaw as a structure or not a structure. Are you defining these platforms that are 30 feet in the air with little kids on them? Are you saying they're platforms or not, uh, are structures or not? We haven't deliberated that point yet. Let us get to it. Okay. I'll be listening carefully. Brenda, did you want to say something? Please. Okay. As far as the platform being inspected, uh, there is nothing in the building code specifically about these types of platforms. So in this situation where they're attached to a tray by way of a friction fit, we'd rely on the opinions of, of an engineer who would confirm that uh, the platform or the structure would be adequate to uh, hold people in this situation. Thank you. All right. Anyone else would like to speak to the, uh, the issue at hand here? All right. Well, there's um, been some discussion about um, the public submitting the real estate um, analysis to contrast what Ms. Ross did. Do we leave this open to accept that material? What I would recommend I think we should do is uh, keep the hearing open, not close it, uh, schedule the next appointment for Tuesday, June 11th, and uh, wrap it up at that time and deliberate. All right. I will not be here. 
Wait, will we will But I, I can do it, yeah. Yeah, that, we, that's fine. Eric, we'll be back. So we'll always have five. Right. Yeah, right. Get five. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Could I just comment on that? Um, if I could confer with my clients, I may have some scheduling issue with June 11th. Could okay. we take a two-minute recess sure. on that? But before we do that, what I would just reiterate is this matter has been open now for over a month. Oh, There's I been that. ample time to submit studies and reports. Okay. The report that we've submitted to you is more comprehensive in that it has additional time periods that were not included in the document that was reviewed by the mm -hmm. court for the four plaintiff's properties. We have all of 2017 in the report that Ms. Ha Ms. Ross submitted, and we've also included 2018. It is a more comprehensive look at the neighborhood as a whole over a longer period of time. Yeah, I think more along the lines of there's such an extreme amount of information and data to look at that I'm not ready to deliberate till midnight tonight. I want to make the right decision. Right. So I think if we come back fresh when you're available, I think that makes the most sense. I don't know how the board feels on that. Yeah. Well, do you guys want to deliberate any aspects of it tonight or not? Well, I mean, I mean, we'd close it, and therefore, we're gonna, no, we're not going to close it. it. We're going to leave. We're going to deliberate and leave it open while we're deliberating. Okay. Yeah, leave it open. Can so we're not leaving it open just to take more information. We're leaving right. it open just so to give us we time can to continue to deliberate on yeah. it. Could, could I just take a moment to look at my schedule and see if June 11th will work? Yeah, next week. Yeah, but we can find a different venue somewhere or a different night. Does that Tuesday night? I have to look at the schedule. I'm pretty, pretty much, but I'm, I'm pretty much booked. Chris and Jim, have we ever deliberated on something without physically closing the public hearing? No, but I, I understand after discussion with Ralph and I, town I, council, we can do so. Can do that? Yeah, yeah if I may, it gives an opportunity of questions arise. Mm -hmm. Since this is a complicated issue, that you may have questions that either the staff needs to address or the applicant needs to address. Okay. There may be, you know, may be questions in the commission. Okay. 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 But once you close it, that's it. It's only amongst yourselves. And additional information can continue to be submitted. Yeah, yeah, why is it as long as it's open, keep on coming in. Well, let's wait for the applicant to. Could we just step out for one minute? Quick recess. Thank you. Fifteen through twenty eighteen. Why did we get? Why did we get? That? I don't know. Seventeen, eighteen. I don't know. Um, uh, is Ralph now? Maureen, do you know how? Do you know how long? Do you know how long Heritage was open? Well, how many years they were open? No, I'm sorry. The uh, uh, Adventure Park. Yeah, I was just curious because they had they we gave us information. Yeah. yeah. What I have just oh. yeah, it's at 2017 and 18. Because in 2017 they already had or they had 18,000 people, but somewhere along the line they had like. Um, it was 30. Yeah. When you was 30,000. <laughs> I don't know where I wrote it. I wrote it somewhere. No. And then they, October 17, I think they closed their... Was it August of 2018? Yeah, because that's right. Cause yeah, because it closed. 831 was the last day they had anyone in there. Yeah. Biggest, biggest year. Yeah. 
and I think they did close them, and they opened up for Hector White, so whatever it's called. Seriously, we're going to probably get ready yeah. for Hector White. Yeah, we're going to close on Thanksgiving. Oh, uh, for, wouldn't that be Columbus Day, or? Yeah, I guess Columbus Day. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I could, before we look at calendars, could Mr. Azram just make one quick response to something that was made, just for the record, so that it's clear? Sure, of course. Um, thank you. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about platforms, and um, uh, I just want to clarify a couple of things. One is that it is definitely uh, the state that does inspect the platforms. But secondly, actually, the platforms uh, are not something that uh, we look at as a structural item. We, um, you can have um, people on that platform, uh, and the platform can essentially, the shims could come out and the platform could drop, and they're still secure with their lifelines. And what we're concerned with is making sure that everybody is secured, and that's why we have the the, the German-made double-locking carabiners that does not allow anybody to disconnect while they're on a course. They can only disconnect once they get back on the ground. So the platforms are there so that uh, people can rest, but it is not uh, something that we consider as structural. That's why we do not require engineer drawings on it, and nor does the state. Thank you very much. Yeah, I did have one question yeah. for uh, Mr. Dunford uh, regarding the, the, the traffic study. Did you use the, the data that um, was actual uh, site visits to compile your estimates? Hi, good evening. Pat Dunford with VHB. Um, we used combination of multiple field visits by myself, um, traffic counting done over a three-year period, and a review of um, transaction data from both Heritage and Adventure Park over that uh, actually four-year period. Does that respond? Yes. It's it this is. So you, you actually did counts. You yes, correct. Counts. 
and so was there any correlation between yes. the actual attendance numbers and the in the traffic to say okay we averaged uh, 2.6 people per car or anything like that um, we did do a limited vehicle vehicle occupancy study where it was in that vicinity of <coughs> two and a half to three people uh, per car uh, it was a very limited afternoon we took a look at that um, what we did find initially the first year we did our studies there really wasn't a direct relationship between the transactions and the traffic counts, which really didn't make any sense. What we found over the course of the three years was that a lot of the volume entering what you'd call the adventure park was actually overflow parking from Heritage, where people would go into Heritage, drive across the street. So what we saw when they constructed the new lot in 2016, um, the volume entering what we'd call adventure park dropped off noticeably in 2017 while Heritage Park went up. Now the businesses likely kept their same level of business. It was just now being accommodated on Heritage Park and Adventure Park had a much lower traffic generation is what we concluded. Okay, that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, if I could just one point. We, we, we produced evidence to reflect that actually the reverse is true that the new facility, the new parking facility was used by visitors to the adventure park because it was um, it was a cleaner and more apparent parking location than the grass field. People actually were directed to and went to the, the paved parking lot across the street as the optimal parking location in lieu of going over the grass field. So it's actually just the opposite. Yes, yeah, please. Uh, in addition to the traffic counting and field observations, we also uh, did a lot of video recording of the activities. And what I saw was a predominant flow of people parking in Adventure Park and then walking off-site towards Heritage. So I'd counter the opposite was what I saw, where the predominant flow was overflow parking on Adventure Park and then people walking to Heritage. I'm sure there may have been some that went the other way, but by and large from watching Painful amounts of video, it was the other direction. Okay. Thank you. And the camera wasn't trained on the area, the path through which people would go from one lot to the other. Okay. All right, we're good. Did Sam, we Sam did you have any, uh, were you talking anything about the uh, streets and the parking? Did, did you wait in before with us? <laughs> well, I, you're always such a wealth of information. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I don't know if that's the case here, but it's, uh, um, I, I believe that the, uh, the memo may have been read into the, the last meeting, which mm -hmm. I was not at, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, all right. Um, you know, we, we in the engineering department, we reviewed the, uh, the traffic uh, assessment. We found that the, uh, the uh, assumptions were, appeared to be all reasonable and, and consistent with what we would be looking for. The VHB? The VHB okay. uh, study, correct. Um, we we noted a, that there were a few few areas uh, on adjacent streets that I think a little more information could be provided because these streets are are not typical uh, uh, streets. Um, there are absent uh, pavement markings and uh, there's some uh, limited pavement width things like that out there. Yeah. Um, that could be perhaps a little better documented in their uh, in their report. But all, all in all, it seemed that it was uh, fairly consistent, and VHP had noted that there was uh, very little uh, impact that yeah. was predicted. Okay, thanks. Scheduling. So could I? Oh, please. So please. the board, I think I heard discussion um, inquiring if there's an opportunity to meet next week. That would be ideal if that's something that the board is able to do. The 11th is, is not a good date for our team. Um, so if there's uh, any opportunity to meet any day next week except Thursday, we will make ourselves available. And I, I will again be gone. I'm leaving in the morning. Okay. But er, well, is Eric back yet? You will be here yet? the 11th anyway, right? I won't be here the 11th or to, to the 19th. How about your next schedule? Week, yeah. I'm gone tomorrow next week. I don't know. When's Eric? Yeah, I don't know if Eric's back yet. Did he say the 9th? Do you know when Eric's back? No. No, when Eric's back. We you have to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> We have to look and see what space is available. We, we really can't get back to you. I think there are the statute. Yeah. Tomorrow. There's, um, there's definitely going to be a meeting on Tuesday with the planning board, so Tuesday is out. Possible, the only possible day would be 
a Wednesday, that's school committee night. So um, if we do have um, something, it would have to be back here. But we have to check availability for here as well. So no, no availability upstairs in the town hall? It's probably school board night. So we, we don't I don't okay. I don't know we, we okay. I'm just a, we just yeah. do Tuesdays that's the days we focus on and we make the concession the arrangements for Tuesdays so this is sort of you know but if that's if, if it's the if that's what the board wants we could we could uh, find out definitely tomorrow I, and I then think we have to uh, we, have at, we have to advertise uh, well that uh, we have to make it known appropriately that we're having this meeting on a non-scheduled zoning board day. I think you'd have to continue that tonight. Okay, so the first option, and then we'll have to schedule another night if it's not. I, I think you, you should continue tonight to yeah, a date might. and time and location certain. Mm -hmm. Right, well, if you can't make it the 11th, I'm not sure if I can make it the 7th. We might have to go two more weeks out. To the 25th. To the 25th. What if the 25th? Oh, I am. Of, are you guys available? Yes. Be back by then. I will. Yeah. Why don't we just do that? We'll. Uh, I can. We're we're gonna leave the special permit open. We're we're not closing it, and uh, we'll make a schedule for deliberations on June 25th at six o'clock. I can here. Good. I've only got one day off next week, and I'm on already scheduled. So All right. So, but but you'll be here the 25th. <laughs> June 25th. Okay. So that'll work then. That'll keep. So we'll that's our regular schedule. So yeah, we know. We can accept any materials up until the up 25th. until that point. Okay. Correct. I mean, we can still accept them that night because the permit's still open. This is still open. Right. Yeah. It's not closed. And then, uh, you know, if there's anything else, comments that we need from, you know, our yes, the the meeting will be open on the 25th for. But we would expect everyone at that point to keep it real short <laughs> so we can get the deliberations done and send everybody home. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to the 25th. All right, so as far as yeah, this crowd's concerned, unless you want to sit around for any longer, we're, we're not going to be deliberating. We're not going to be doing anything else with regard to this permit tonight. But it will be open and rescheduled for June 25th at 6 o'clock here in this room. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have, uh, we have no new business. We're not deliberating. It's still about the things. Uh, I have oh, I'll, I'll make, make a motion to continue the public hearing until June 25th at 6 o'clock. Oh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Are there any other matters? Yeah, just, uh, just to let everybody know, we have a, um, a minor modification for Terrapin Ridge, which yeah. we'll be hearing, looking at on June 11th at Sand Hill Square. So we do have something. Is that the only thing that'll be open that day? <laughs> okay. And actually, he's away. Um, we, uh, then I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Make up to adjourn tonight's public meeting. Two hearings in a row. Did I do it before? Right. You need a vacation. The, 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 uh, the, uh, I, I didn't mean to close. Okay. Hand yeah. yeah. signals. All right. So, we, you made the motion to I made adjourn. The motion. I'll second. Jim second. Adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Sorry, Chris. Let me take it down.